Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to one more panel of the Mary Forum 2014. I'm Athanasios Manis, a research fellow at Mary. I'm sure you have all been following the developments in Kobani. There has been great anticipation about what will happen on the ground in Syria, especially after Peshmerga forces were authorized by the Turkish government to access the city through its soil. As the latest events demonstrate, Turkey remains an important and active regional actor. Since the first justice and development government came into power in 2002, Turkey has developed a strategy of engagement with its neighboring countries. Prime Minister Ahmed Davutoglu argues that Turkey's history and geography are assets to be employed and not ignored. Accordingly, he has put forward a zero-problem strategy with neighbors. This panel will address interesting questions such as the main characteristics of AKP neighborhood policies towards the Middle East. Furthermore, it will discuss the extent to which AKP's neighborhood policies have been successful or not. What are the dilemmas, risks and limitations of today's Turkish neighborhood policy? Are the latest developments in Syria and Egypt challenging the rationale of Turkish neighborhood policies? If so, what are the lessons that the Turkish government can draw from them? In addition, the panel will address how regional politics feed into the relationship between international and regional stakeholders such as, the, such as Turkey and the US. How does the US perceive the role of Turkey in the region, complementary or antagonistic? Are there conflicting interests between the two countries in the region? I would like to have specific insights from our panel, and I'm certain that we will get these insights. So for our panel, we have invited three distinguished speakers, Jengiz Chandar, Dr. Shaban Kardash, and Michael Verch. Jengiz Chandar is a Turkish journal journalist, senior columnist in Daily Radical, an expert on Middle East and especially on the Kurdish issue, who lectured on the modern history of the Middle East and current Middle East politics for a decade in several Istanbul universities. He was a special advisor to late President Turgut Ozal. Having the reputation of masterminding the establishment of relations between Turkey and the Iraqi Kurdish leadership in 1991 with Jalal Talabani and Masoud Barzani. An author of a number of books, the last being the bestseller Mesopotamia Express, A Journey in History, 2012 published also in Arabic and translated into Sarani Kurdish. Dr. Shaban Kardash is the president of Orsam Middle East Strategic Research Center and a faculty member at the Department of International Relations at TOB, University of Economics and Technology in Ankara. He has published scholarly articles and book chapters on Turkish domestic and foreign policy human rights, energy policies, and international security, and has been an occasional contributor to Turks and international media. He's assistant editor to the quarterly journal Perceptions, a rights analysis for the German Marshall Funds on Turkey series. He has taught classes at Diplomacy Academy, Sakarya University, and the Turkish Military Academy. He received his doctoral degree in political science from the University of Utah. Dr. Kardash also holds a master's degree in international relations from the Middle East Technical University in Ankara and a second master's degree in European studies from the Center for European Integration Studies in Bonn, Germany. Mr. Michael Verch is a senior fellow at the American Progress where he is a member of the national security team. He has been a senior transatlantic fellow at the German Marshall Fund. He has held appointments as a public policy scholar at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C., and as a John Fitzgerald Kennedy Memorial Fellow at Harvard's Minda de Gunzburg Center for European Studies. So I would like to ask our speakers to give a 15-minute presentation that will be followed by questions and answers. So, Mr. Chandar, please. Thank you. Uh, first, I have to express uh, my happiness to be in Erbil thanks to this Mary Forum which I witnessed its pregnancy period. It's less than a year 
when we met in Istanbul with Dilaver Aladdin, speaking how a think tank can be formed in Kurdistan region. And now it's, as we witnessed today, less than a year, it is already born. It, uh, in a very impressive uh, environment with a very high level uh, and impressive also participation. So uh, I uh, thank Dilawar Aladdin be becoming so efficient in establishing this Mary Forum, uh, which I believe will be one of the exemplary institutions the Kurds are introducing to the Middle East in our period. Uh, I just want to start uh, my talk with a reference uh, to a person uh, which I have certain similarities. His name is Joschka Fischer. He has been the foreign minister of Germany. The similarity is that we are of the same age. He is six months older than me. Secondly, in our youth, although we are still young in many ways, uh, in our youth, we had been both Marxist activists, so we have a very similar background. Thirdly, in many strategic issues, we look, I, as, as much as I feel, we look alike, uh, and uh, uh, I can just refer to a very recent article, just three days ago, that he had written, I read, uh, uh, with the title, The Middle East, New Winners and Losers. This is the title of his article, in which he says, the Islamic States, meaning Daesh, the Islamic States' military triumphs in Iraq and Syria are not only fueling a humanitarian catastrophe, they are also throwing the region's existing alliances into disarray and even calling into question national borders. A new Middle East is emerging, one that already differs from the old order in two significant ways, an enhanced role, uh, yeah, these two significant ways. The first is an enhanced role for the Kurds and Iran. The second, the diminished influence for the region's Sunni powers. This is his observation, more or less, I share, that's why I made a reference to his very recent article uh, with the title, The Middle East, New Winners and Losers. That means if there are three elements we will be talking about. First, an emergence of a new Middle East. We will be seeing, debating, discussing, and commenting on a new Middle East. Secondly, there are winners in this new Middle East. One is, it needs a lot of debate, I know, but that is Iran. The second is, it has become a, as if a consensus and indisputable fact that it is the Kurds. It doesn't name any organization or an institution or a, 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 an entity like uh, KRG here or Rojava, the Kurds in general. A new actor as a winning actor in the formation of the new Middle East. So when we get into the debate, it again needs a debate to losers, which he says the region Sunni powers, one of them is Turkey. The others, if they merit to be called a power, whether it's Saudi Arabia, and I have no anti-position, but let uh, some people should forgive me if I would say Qatar is not a power. It doesn't have the, 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 the uh, 
ingredient to be called as a power, or Egypt, that could be a power, but it is again, because of a variety of reasons, on the losing edge of the emerging new Middle East, but our issue here is to discuss Turkey and its foreign policy. So then uh, Turkey is categorized through its policy vis-a-vis -vis the emergence of the new Middle East is one of the losing ends of the new Middle East equation. Having the diminished influence as it is underlined. There is an interesting asymmetry yet in this qualification in the sense that inherently it means if there is a Kurdish rise, then there is a Turkish demise or diminishing influence if we put it in a milder terms. This shouldn't be the case. With Turkey's rise, the Kurds should rise, or with the Kurdish rise, the Turkish position as a projecting power in the region should also rise. So there is an asymmetry, and if there is an asymmetry, which there is, then there is something wrong with the Turkish foreign policy. Can we measure the mistake, if there is a mistake, and I believe there is, of Turkish foreign policy in terms of the neighborhood, of course, which is our title, the title of this panel. And it is a very empirical measure that I will be referring to. In the year 2008, we had the same political power in Turkey, Justice and Development Party, or AKP, Today's prime minister was Turkey's foreign minister, the architect of its neighborhood policy, and today's president was Turkey's prime minister. That was the year 2008, and Turkey nominated itself to be a member of the United Nations Security Council. The vote was taken, 2008, Turkey received 161 votes to be elected as a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council. That was, that, that was a remarkable measure of the success of the Turkish foreign policy or the international system acting as a recipient of a functional and important Turkey to its uh, foreign policy. This year, Turkey again nominated itself to be the non-permanent member of the UN Security Council. And the Turkish foreign minister went for lobbying to New York in person. The vote came out 61. It lost with a margin of nearly 100 votes. Six years ago it was 151, now it is 61. The countries voting for Turkey's membership uh, for UN Security Council. And the information leaked to the Turkish media that it was mainly Saudis and Egyptians lobbied against Turkey's membership, who are supposed to be the Sunni power centers of the Middle East. Lobbying against another Sunni power center at a time and in a period where this region is having a very dramatic and drastic sectarian conflict. So after underlining this, if we go back to what happened, there are two different phases of today's government's foreign policy performance. The first period was an uphill trend. 
presumably a successful Turkish foreign policy that put Turkey at the international stage as an important regional, emerging regional power and a, a, a functional international player. What made it? It is the introduction of Turkish soft power. Turkey entered into the Middle East game or moved into its neighborhood, departed from hands-off policies, adopted a proactive policy vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East and to the uh, neighborhood, to the introduction of commerce, trade, and in the political arena, through mediation efforts. So this is what was called the introduction of soft power. The Turks in this region, as they, uh, as they are registered in history, as considered with its muscle, ruling the region for 400 years in a very centralized imperial state system. Now there is a new Turkey coming back to the region through its soft power, with goods, with services, with diplomacy. This did happen and could happen with a position of not asking any regime change in the region. That means Turkey was ready to engage with who, whomever is in power, whomever is government in anywhere in the region. Baghdad, fine. Damascus, fine. Amman, fine. Tel Aviv, all right. Cairo, it goes well. So, zero problems with the neighbor's policy coined by the architect of this Turkish opening, then foreign minister, today's prime minister, Mr. Davutoğlu. So it was a good phrase. It was a good music to many ears. Uh, no problems with the neighbors. If you accept the status quo, then no problems with the neighbors. We had in Turkey only problems with the Kurds. There was no recognition in the way it, it had to be with KRG, with Erbil. Other than Erbil, there were really zero problems with the neighbors. The big change came with the Arab Spring, what it is called in the international media as Arab Spring. With the Arab Spring, the same government, the same architects of the Turkish foreign policy stepped in to sponsor the change. So it was a very radical shift from engaging with the status quo into changing the status quo, sponsoring the change. If that would be successful, that will be the emergence of new imperial Turkey in the new age. But it, 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 it didn't become successful. It turned out to be all problems with every neighbors, except KRG. With the KRG, from 2009, new relations were developed. And uh, so with the exception of KRG, just the opposite uh, to what it was before, from zero problems with neighbors, Turkey moved into problems with everybody in the region, which diminished, of course, its standing and its role. The time limitation needs me to accelerate, and I will uh, not be able to say uh, what I was intending to say, so I will jump, and maybe during the question and answer period we can deal with some issues. But let me 
just move very quickly to certain points, uh, that the moment of truth came with Kobani in revealing uh, uh, the, the uh, imperatives of the current uh, uh, Turkish foreign policy. Because Kobani, which is synonymously meant to be the emergence of Daesh or ISIS in the region. So when we speak of the moment of truth, we speak of ISIS and Kobani, which revealed Turkey's situation. That is, number one, it revealed frictions between Turkey and its age-long Western allies above all the United States of America. Turkey is the only NATO member country in the region and the most passive element in the region in dealing with the ISIS threat or bystander in a way in Kobani. Can you imagine the largest second army of NATO bringing all its tanks sitting 500 meters from Kobani where the Kurdish people of Kobani are facing the threat of a massacre with a flood of refugees coming to the Turkish side of the border and every single television outlet in the world is shooting the pictures as a live show of the fight in Kobani and this is shown every day, every news hour, everywhere in the world and millions of people are looking, Turkish tanks standing up and smoke coming up to the sky from Kobani and the Kurds are fighting. At a certain point, the Americans are entering into the game, which stayed aloof, sending supplies from air, not from land, the American weapons did not enter to Kobani from Murshid Pınar gate. It is airlifted over Kobani. And U.S. is the, the boss, the chief of the NATO alliance, which Turkey is a member. Because there is no convergence of Turkish-American policies vis-a-vis -vis Kobani and vis-a-vis -vis ISIS. So Kobani and ISIS has become the moment of truth, revealing out Turkey's new picture of its foreign policy in the neighborhood. Number one, as I said earlier, uh, it revealed the frictions between its Western allies, above all with the United States. Secondly, it created a very bitter perception among the Kurds vis-a-vis -vis Turkey, while there has to be an ongoing reconciliation process in Turkey, therefore jeopardizing uh, the reconciliation of Turkey between its own Kurds and also with Syrian Kurds, with Rojava, who became integrated with each other. Every day, literally every day, Yes, I, I will be concluding. Every day, literally, there are funerals of the fallen YPG fighters of Kobani. Where those funerals? In Diyarbakir, in Van, in Hakkari, in Suruç, in the Turkish Kurdish areas. So, Turkish Kurds and Syrian Kurds has become an integrated whole, and the Turkish foreign policy as it is displayed vis-a-vis -vis ISIS and the developments in Kobani, is creating a, a nightmare for the future of Turkish-Kurdish relations. To conclude, I'm jumping to the conclusion that uh, what has to be done for Turkey is a new paradigm shift of its neighborhood policy. A total 180 degrees 
shift from what it is at the moment. That needs, number one, reconciliation with its own Kurds to promote unity. This, is, this will be the domestic dimension of Turkish new attitude. Number two, it has to promote unity between the and among the Kurds, between KRG and PKK and PYD, between the Kurds of Turkey, Syria and Iraq altogether. Until now, Turkey is known to have a traditional divide and rule position vis-a-vis -vis the Kurds, not only its own Kurds, but in general vis-a-vis like, -vis the Kurds. So not only that it has to reconcile with its own Kurds, but it has to promote the unity of the Kurds, unity of Turkey with, with the concept of Kurdistan in general. Number three, through this uh, engagement and connection, it has to project itself as an emerging regional power which will be, which will act as a Turkish dash hyphen Kurdish power center. Uh, so this will be the regional dimension of its uh, foreign policy that could come, come up. And this, all these will ameliorate its relationship with the Western system, which Turkey is institutionally, and since decades, is a part of. So let me stop here. I would like to emphasize uh, three elements from your presentation, which was very insightful and very interesting. The first is that turkey kurdish relations are not necessarily zero sum, it's not necessarily a zero sum game. The second is that there are two phases of AKP neighborhood policies, which you described in detail. And the third is that there should be a new paradigm shift for Turkish foreign policy. I'm sure we'll come back to the, these three main elements during our Q&A. So I would like now to ask uh, Dr. Uh, Kardash to give his own presentation, please, in 15 minutes. I also would like to thank the Dilaver Bey. Actually, when he sat on this endeavor, uh, Cengiz Bey suggested him to contact me. While he was visiting Ankara, I was in Erbil uh, to attend another meeting. We couldn't meet at that time, but we managed to meet on my next visit uh, to Erbil. And we collaborated with a joint event in Washington, D.C. this August about Iraq and the future of the region and the Kurds and Turkey. And I am very pleased to be here attending this inaugural event. Also, I am also very pleased to be with Cengiz Bey, whom I have been reading uh, since my early days as a student, later a, a university professor. I have some disagreements with him, which I will save to the end of my uh, presentation, especially the moments of truth, because as a close follower of his writing, he has been talking about very important moments of truth, but sometimes they do hold, sometimes they don't. So I am also quite pessimistic about whether Kobana is the real moment of truth in this big game that's unfolding in the Middle East. But Mr. Chair asked me to talk about the Turkish uh, neighborhood policy. I also would uh, start briefly and share with you how I see it. Partly it will uh, overlap with uh, Cengiz Bey's uh, presentation. Uh, I used to always talk about the regional uh, policy of uh, Turkey, also reminding the fact that Turkey is a multi-regional power. Although right now we are talking and focusing mostly on the Middle Eastern dimension of Turkish foreign policy, when we look at uh, Turkey's regional policies, we see some uh, themes, uh, principles, that do appear not only in the Middle East, but also in other regions. So we have to uh, keep that multi-regional uh, dimension. Of course, when they are applied to the Middle East, there are special uh, characteristics of uh, that regional policy. And then uh, sometimes that uh, policy has been uh, characterized, characterized as neo-Ottomanism and sometimes mistakenly as zero, uh, zero problems policy. This is, uh, I think, one of the most uh, fundamental misunderstanding and misconceptualization uh, of uh, Turkey's regional policies. The way I see it, uh, the way I think the uh, Prime Minister Davutoğlu, when he was still an advisor 
framed uh, the zero problems principle, he meant the following. So in his understanding, Turkey is a regional power, not a normal regional power, and he doesn't like Turkey to be called a regional power. He instead uh, prefers what he calls Merkez Ülke, central power. So that central uh, power is a unique uh, category which he thinks uh, Turkey does deserve, but for a long time Turkey did ignore. Now it is time for uh, Turkey to act as a central power. And interestingly, zero problems is only one of the principles that do make up central power. And it is, again, interesting with the second principle, zero problems with neighbors, not the first one. Uh, the first one is balance between freedoms and security at home and in the region. And there are also other principles. So uh, this conceptual clarification, I think, is needed to understand the transformation of Turkey's regional policy, the two phases you mentioned, which I also agree, because in the two phases, we don't see the change of policy. The policy is still the same, the central power concept, but the principles that are highlighted are changing in the two phases, which are also because of the very nature of the region, which we have, have to keep in mind. So what does this central power uh, concept mean? It does mean Turkey should reclaim its prestige uh, position in the region, uh, come back to the region uh, with more uh, extensive ties, as Cengiz Bey suggested, with soft power, but also with uh, political instruments. For instance, the recent uh, uh, foreign policy initiatives of Turkey have uh, developed what we call high-level strategic cooperation councils, which were initially developed with Syria, Iraq, and later with Russia, uh, Greece, with other neighbors as well. It's not just a soft power strategy. It is also very much a uh, political strategical approach where we see high level strategic dialogue. Economic power is uh, one part of it. So usually I used to see it as a sort of uh, neolib neoliberal uh, from the international relations uh, jargon, uh, understanding of the region and regional order. In a sense, Turkey was trying to uh, bolster uh, crystallize and trigger regionalization, regional level cooperation, regional integration in the Middle East, in the Balkans, hopefully centered on Turkey. So this is the uh, central uh, power approach. So in a sense, Turkey was trying to build a regional order. And in that sense, at the time until the so-called Arab Spring, Turkey was willing and ready to act with the existing uh, rulers didn't see any problems uh, cooperating uh, with them. But still, in the background, I think uh, Turkey did have this transformative vision about the political systems. Then we look back at 2003, for instance, uh, at that time, Abdullah Gül's uh, presentation, uh, Davutoğlu's speeches here and there, 2004, 2005, they always had the notion of political transformation in the region speaking to different international and regional Muslim audiences. But it wasn't uh, at the very forefront of uh, Turkish foreign policy. And later, when the Syrian uprising uh, started, actually at one point, Assad said, well, you know, this Erdogan, he kept asking me when he visited Damascus, talk to Muslim Brotherhood. Post facto, we can say that even when uh, Erdogan or uh, Turkey was talking to Assad, in the background, that transformative vision was very much there. We should, I think, uh, underline that. But still, overall, the zero problems uh, with neighbors policy was based on uh, understanding you have to work with the current regimes because they were, in a sense, credible and sustainable partners that can deliver. When you cut a deal, you know they will deliver. But after the Arab Spring with the regional transformation, the problem is not just the borders are questioned, but the rulers are losing their legitimacy and credibility and ability to deliver. This is the problem, and this is where uh, we moved into a new phase. But still, when we used to talk about the zero problems, I wouldn't agree with Cengiz Bey's characterization that before 2010, uh, Turkey did not apply the zero problems with neighbors uh, principle to KRG. Actually, it started after 2007-2008. If uh, Murat Bey, Murat Özçelik, was able to come here today. He was very instrumental when he was serving in Baghdad to initiate that policy. It is not that 
uh, uh, zero problems with uh, neighbors principle applied to KRG started after Darabsky. This start before that in our academic writings uh, we did uh, cover that as part of the new uh, Turkish uh, foreign policy. And then overall with the Arab Spring the biggest uh, challenge to Turkey is that Turkey is trying to in its own world uh, stimulate a regional integration mechanism, regional order based on the regional actors. So the paradigm at that time, I used it in my own writings, regional solutions to regional problems. This was sort of the gist and the spirit of uh, Turkey's neighborhood policy before the Arab Spring. And then the Arab Spring started, I think Turkey still wanted to go with the same rhythm, especially in Syria. Initially, Turkey tried to solve it uh, through a dialogue with Iran, but it did realize that it wouldn't be able to deliver. And then after that, the Foreign Minister Davutoğlu, I remember uh, early 2012, he visited Tehran, Moscow, then to Washington. Over time, Turkey did realize that the regional divisions among Sunni and other actors were so deep that the regional paradigm would not be able to deliver. And then on its own, Turkey also lacked the capability to solve the region's deep problems. And this is when we see that uh, Turkey is uh, coordinating more deeply with the West. The changing uh, Turkey's position, for instance, on the uh, NATO uh, early warning systems as part of uh, the missile shield project, uh, Turkey's invitation of uh, NATO uh, petrol batteries uh, along the Syrian uh, border. We see that the regional paradigm, the neighborhood policy paradigm is affected by that. But still, when the Arab uh, uprisings started, Turkey acted with this what I call transformative vision. That in the long run, the transformation in the region will be good because there will be more representative regimes and whoever comes to power probably will be closer to Turkey than the current uh, rulers. So Turkey was in a sense betting on the future and jumped into the business of supporting that transformation. But still again another point I uh, would like to disagree with Cengiz Bey, that support was not the main critical independent variable to explain the regional transformation. So here I think in order to assess whether Turkish foreign policy is successful or failed or whether Iranian foreign policy, whether the Kurds are winning or losing, we have to look at the region. The transformation, deep tectonic transformation, is it Turkey's own making or is it something external to Turkey? I think uh, the transformation is so deep that even if Turkey had stayed complete out of it, it was going to take place anyway. So Turkey is in a sense external to the uh, transformation, trying to respond to it, not shaping. So most of the analysis that do suggest that Turkey created a mess, now it is uh, paying the price, do miss the fact that the transformation is so deep, to, so tectonic that it is beyond anybody's, any single actor's ability to shape on its own individually. So when we do evaluate an individual country's policy on, in terms of success or failure, we have to, I think, uh, keep that uh, part uh, point in mind. So what Turkey uh, tried to implement was a transformative vision. So it uh, pursued the policy of engagement. So I think the most obvious uh, reflection was in the case of, for instance, uh, open door policy uh, to the Syrian refugees. In the literature, we always teach our students in the international security classes, refugees are a security threat. Turkey could have uh, adopted a similar approach from day one. But instead of that, I know that uh, the Prime Minister Erdogan at that time said, anybody who tries to cross this part on humanitarian grounds should be allowed. So this is an engagement policy, but it comes with the risks. And now uh, all the foreign fighters issued the rest of the uh, Syrian uh, story. I think uh, are partly some risks Turkey took by pursuing an active engagement strategy. I remember Cengiz Bey, after the Reyhanlı uh, bombings, he said, well, there is a price to pay as a regional power. So this is one approach I think uh, Erdogan also adopted uh, very much. So this was an active engagement policy. It did expose Turkey in uh, certain respects, but it was seen as a risk worth taking because in the long run, Turkey, I think, still uh, thinks uh, so. 
the transformation uh, process might be in evolving in ways that will be in line with uh, Turkey's expectations. But over time, especially the Syrian conflict and uh, the recent phase of uh, Syrian conflict after Iraq, we see that the regional transformation has been characterized by the security externalities more than the political transformation. This is uh, what is putting pressure on Turkey's engagement policy. Now we see uh, calls for uh, coming from the opposition parties, uh, calls for sort of isolation or containment, which, is, which has been the Western policy to some extent. But personally, the way I observe it, uh, Turkey will not go as far as containment or isolation, but Turkey will uh, have to maintain a very critical uh, distance. Still engaged, but now more conscious and aware of the security externalities of the regional uh, transformations. H how many minutes do I have? Uh, okay, let's go for a two-minute uh, conclusion. Now the challenge in the region uh, is deep. As I said, usually when I do uh, grade my students, there is no fixed best answer. So when I do grade, one student can get an A in one class, but the same student can get a C in another class. Every evaluation is relative. In order to evaluate Turkish foreign policy, Turkish success, Turkish failure, we have to keep in mind the context. And then the regional transformation is so deep. Now, we cannot use the normal criteria here. We cannot use the criteria of 2010 to evaluate Turkish foreign policy in 2014. We cannot use soft power because Originally, I was uh, very critical when uh, Cengiz Bay uh, was very supportive of AK Party foreign policy. I was critical because they were talking too much about soft power. You cannot ignore hard power. Uh, right now, the problem is not that Turkey is, has given up soft power. The problem is that we lack enough hard power or other means to respond to the current challenge in the region, which is very deep. Secondly, we do great at the end of the exam not in the middle of the exam. So I think this is also another important point. Are we done? Is the process over? Who is winning, who is losing? I remember Bashar Assad, uh, he was interviewed back in 2012 by a Western journalist, I guess. They asked him, Mr. Assad, are you thinking you did some mistakes? He said, well, let's wait till the end of the game. I think Assad was smarter than most of us. Uh, it sounds so. We don't know what is the end game rate. And then I think uh, the regional transformation is a deep, long game, unfolding. What we say today about the rise of Kurds, two days later it might be different. When I was back here in uh, uh, April, everybody was talking about independence, but in the last two days there is a completely different atmosphere here in two months' time, in two years' time, we don't know. So this is a long game, and we have to always be provisional in our conclusions. There is no moment of truth that will decide the fate of Turkey, the fate of Kurds, or another. So the game is still unfolding. We have to keep in mind. And then uh, Turkey, I think, has it been failure or successful? There have been uh, challenges. Uh, Turkey has given a hard test. If I were in power, I might have acted differently, but overall I think uh, the foreign policy of Turkey gets a passing uh, grade. So there is still a pragmatism. Turkey does still affect the outcomes on the ground. You talk about the rise of curse and the fall of uh, Turkey's sort of reasoning, but we know the financial condition of the KRG. We know where Turkey stands on it, what uh, contribution Turkey does to the financial and economic and political independence of the KRG. We have to look at the real uh, power distribution and power asymmetries in the region. So I think Turkey is uh, fine. There is a good degree of pragmatism to respond to the changing situation. Kobani is a good example. Turkey did make its contribution on its own conditions. And then I think there is one more element, which is the principled uh, aspects of Turkish foreign policy. This is very ties to Egypt. So in recent years, Turkey has also tried to act more in principled ways, in more idealist ways. I think this is good, but this is also 
sort of a liability in some senses. The principled approach is coming with a price where it is limiting the pragmatism, especially in the case of Egypt or in the case of the repercussions of Egypt for the Gulf, uh, Turkey Gulf relations. Uh, that principled approach uh, is sometimes limiting Turkey's ability to move according to the dictates uh, of the situation. But it is a matter of whether you can pay the price. The decision makers think they can. I think maybe we could have acted differently. Thank you. It was a very insightful and articulate presentation. Uh, you explained very nicely the underpinnings of the zero problem policy. You talked about regionalization and integration. You also talked about challenges that Turkey faces uh, in the Middle East because the Middle East is a changing and Turkey is not causing the change but it's externally related to Turkey. And you also talk about the limitations, uh, or the limitations that uh, Turkey has in terms of uh, uh, f uh, solving regional problems. So I would like to go now to our third speaker, uh, Mr. Wirtz, you have 15 minutes, please. Thank you very much. And uh, let me also say uh, thank you for uh, having the opportunity to speak here. It's a great honor and a great pleasure. And uh, to be on a panel with uh, Genghis Bey is uh, always uh, the, the best thing that can happen to you as a policy person. I'd like to speak about the uh, relationship between the United States and Turkey, which is a relationship that was very close until very recently and has dramatically deteriorated in recent weeks. And that is an astonishing development which uh, very rarely happens. Um, for the United States, a, a good partner, in, especially in this region, but in, in, in a world that is in disorder, is a partner that uh, not only devises smart foreign policy, but has three assets and three pillars that are important. A, that partner ideally has de democratic legitimacy in its own country for what it does externally. That partner also has tactical abilities, understanding situations and moving quickly and making adjustments. And also ideally that partner has a strategic vision and understands complex regional dynamics like they're happening here in this region. And to a certain degree, when the AKP came to power in 2002 and uh, Prime Minister uh, uh, Erdogan uh, then, uh, or then in, the, in the early days was describing the new policy as one that wanted to make sure that Turkey was not under the impression anymore that it was surrounded by enemies, <laughs> was a very important step. The old saying was, Turkey is surrounded by three oceans or three seas and four enemies. And it was an important step to, to change that regional dynamic as, uh, as has been pointed out. Uh, and of course, the domestic equivalent was the Kurdish opening, the first one, where there was a dual strategy of demilitarizing the Turkish society and neutralizing and overcoming the Kurdish conflict, which of course back then uh, didn't work out. And that was one of the reasons why President Obama in 2009 went to Ankara. And he has done something that no president has done before, on his first trip to Europe, he went to Turkey. Has never happened before. He gave a very important speech in the uh, parliament in Ankara, and he offered a longer term strategic partnership to Turkey. And that partnership has been, has been strong uh, uh, over the past few years. But there were three turning points um, that have uh, taken that partnership apart. And those three turning points are associated with three cities, one in Turkey, one in Iraq, and one in Syria. The first turning point from a US perspective was Gezi Park. The protests in Istanbul were entirely manageable protests. But the Turkish government tried to push back very hard. And you all know that uh, days and weeks of street fighting ensued. And from a US perspective, that was a culmination point in two senses. A, it was clear that continuing concern about press censorship, soft and hard, internet censorship, social media censorship, interference of the government and the judiciary were really coming to a, to a culmination point. Gezi Park uh, epitomized and reflected that concern that Turkish society was moving back on democratic achievements. It was also analytically important because it showed that there was no force within the AKP, namely President Gül, 
who would stand up and say, we want to be a moderate conservative party that unites our country. There was no such force in the AKP. So from a US perspective, it was clear that the Turkey as a partner was losing one of the important capacities, domestic democratic legitimacy for its policies, domestically and, and uh, foreign. The second turning point was Mosul. Um, the, the governor of Mosul sent distress calls to Baghdad and other places on June 6, and everybody knew that the city was under imminent threat of ISIS. And on June 10, Foreign Minister Davutoglu said there is no risk for the Turkish consulate, there's no risk for Turkish citizens. At the General Consul Yilmaz and, and uh, other Turkish citizens were taken hostage. What was the reaction in Turkey? The reaction was not to sit back and say, what went wrong? Let's try to figure out what was the, what was the wrong assessment. The reaction was that Prime Minister Erdogan, four days later, asked the Turkish press not to report on Mosul, not to report on ISIL, and an Ankara court issued an order, which was given to all the media on June 17th, basically outlawing any reporting on this issue. So again, from a US perspective, an important partner shows that the tactical abilities, the understanding of shifting situations, it was really limited. And so was the capability of Turkey to extract its, its citizens, uh, including senior level diplomats from Mosul. It was either lack of capabilities or lack of, of, of decision making, but this also shows that the second pillar of an important partnership was being weakened. The third turning point was Kobani. And it was as much Turkey's neutrality that Cengiz has described as was the reaction to the street protests in Turkey on October 6 and October 7. The interesting thing here is that, of course, the conflict became regional. And the peace process in Turkey between government and PKK was, for the first time, driven by external developments more than by domestic developments. And it seemed that the government did not fully understand that. And the distinction between Kurds in Turkey and Kurds outside Turkey was still an, a, a, a paradigm of Turkish policy. And the fact that this was not fully understood and that the Turkish government seemed to like the peace, but, but not as much the process that goes with the peace, um, was questioning the third pillar of, of Turkey's capability, the strategic and longer term understanding of regional dynamics in a very complicated arena. And so um, from a US perspective, I think the turning point was really October 19th, when the United States dropped humanitarian aid and ammunition into Kobani without really informing the Turkish government. That was a clear decision in the White House that American interests and the protection of Kobani were more important than the immediate relationship with the Turkish government, uh, which was probably a very, very difficult decision to make. But it also shows that we have come to an end point between 2009, President Obama's visit, and 2014 within a five-year period, which requires a reconceptualization of the partnership between US and Turkey. And that process is underway in Washington right now. It didn't help Turkey that um, uh, uh, high-level diplomats like the U US uh, ambassador to Turkey, Frank Cardione, were frequently insulted by high-level members of the Turkish government, uh, then Prime Minister Erdogan insinuating that the, that the uh, ambassador was involved in illicit and illegal activity in Turkey, or Ankara Mayor Meli Göcek saying that the United States had divided to govern and divide Turkey. That is, of course, not helpful if you want to have a French relationship. But this, the larger points, democratic legitimacy for domestic and foreign policy in Turkey, tactical capabilities of understanding of fast-moving environments, and the strategic understanding of the regional dynamics are really the issues that are now driving the policy conversation in Washington. I think it is the relationship is already undergoing a very fundamental uh, change. This will continue for the time being. And this, at the same time, opens up opportunities for new conversations, especially for Kurdish actors in the region, um, that uh, are required uh, to uh, better understand what are US and Western priorities in the region, and what are local actors and regional actors prepared to invest in a, in a possible partnership 
because what we have seen on the ground, the de facto cooperation between the United States and YPG is something that probably none of us would have, have even thought about two, three, or four months ago. So it's an, it's an interesting shift that was not always intentional, but it was driven by domestic factors and dynamics in Turkey, the military dynamic on the ground uh, in northern Syria, and also an assessment in Washington that uh, the divergence between uh, Turkish uh, and American interests uh, were so large that that conflict eventually had to become open. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very good insightful overview uh, over how and why the perception of the U.S. changed vis-a-vis uh, -vis Turkey. Uh, because we're running out of time, uh, I will skip my questions and I would like to open the floor for questions immediately. So I will be taking three questions at a time. Uh, Shukran Jazeera. اسمحوا ان اسمحوا لي ان ابدي اعجابي بالسيد جنجيس على ما ما يحمل من فكر النير اشد على يديك اطال الله بعمرك السؤال هو في عام 1915 الامبراطوريه العثمانيه قتلت من الارمن كلدان سريان اشوريين قرابه 3 ملايين وهؤلاء الناس هم أصل المنطقة وكان دماردين أكبر مدينة يقتنوها السريان اليوم توزعوا في الشرق ويقتنون في أستراليا أمريكا أوروبا ولا يزال عينهم على أرضهم على أرض, أرض أجدادهم أوكي. السؤال هو ألم يحن الوقت تركيا تعترف بمذابح الأرمن وتعيد أرضها أرضهم إلى أصحابهم شكرا جزيلا. Thank you. Over there. Yeah, please. أوي ألم بانيا لا بينيم سيش الداسكرا. يكم درباري دولي السعودية ومصر ولا وكو دولة السني كلنا وسك دولة جارن باشا ناتو تركيا دعي مصالحة كرد تركيا لقال ويكا أمريكا خيرايا لا سارة سري مشيلة كانوا خيرادي تجا من يكم شدالهم بالنسبة لتعبتي السعودية والسعودية لكاتيكا بجدارة لا لداني داعش لو تحالفي كهيا كتي اما ابين لعلامة وابستين لو يارمتياني كبو داعش اروى لكارتوني يارمتي كان نسراوى المملكة العربية السعودية لنا قوسيا كان نسراوى المملكة الإنسانية لكاتيكا افرتي كرد فسادك لي كتي كرد الرفين لي وصاحي كردستاني جبوتا شويني شرشي قورة خالي دوام خيرا من بخيرا اي الام ابينم يعني دوري ناتو لو لم دانوي تركيا هات سند او اندامو بيك ولا اكريبرين لاوازا روجانا كرد لحدود لايكوباني ابينين كرد كجري لناو سياره كي خوي غازي بسرا اكري بريندار بيني خونك رجي بسر عرضا نايبا بوخسته خانه كان يا تاخير انك امريه يعني خالي كثير من ابينم جديد نيه لمصالحي لو اكريبرين قفتو غوي مفاوضات الى بين كرد وتركيا بتابتي لا ينشوا للان تركيا كتب جديتي زور زور بلام تركيا وانيا اجر وايا راستا تون اكريا لقال يكشكا قفتو قوب كي لسجن زندانو بند كراوا معنى وايو كسا ازادنيا سربزنيا خالي كتير لكوتايا دي ساندي موصر امريكا ابينم جادنيا وكو او برادر لباني اليا كماوتي بنسبة ديك لايك نوي داعش اجر خيرا أيوة داعش لنا وبرية وأما بين تشار مانجا لكردستان بوتساحي كي شريكي تواو لكوباني تا كوباشي كتي لما وي دو حفتيا لشري كندو صدامي لنا وبردياني خالي كي تركا ما ديقيني قرانيك ومن بوهمو كرد بوهمو كردستان وبوهمو كرد للدنيا 
especially that goes to uh, Mr. Chandar and Close. sorry <laughs> to Mr. Chandar and uh, Professor Shaban and so far to me it looks like that the uh, uh, sorry sorry as so far it looks to me like the peace process in Turkey and especially the dialogue uh, has been conducted by the government with the Kurdish actors and population and I have a question is can it be that the, like ethnic Turks uh, feel or have been excluded from that process? And particularly what is being done to address the fears and the lack of understanding of the importance of solving the Kurdish question with the Turkish society in general, in order of maybe also changing the public opinion, which is important at the end for the foreign policy of Turkey. Thank you. Would you like please to respond? Would you like to respond? Yes, the, 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 the second one, there was no question, I think. So the, the, the first question about the Armenian genocide issue, which the next year, 2015, will be the 100th anniversary of it, it, is, it will be a very big headache for uh, Turkey's image uh, and in, in terms of Turkish foreign policy. It is a well known, a well understood fact uh, by different segments of the society and also by the leaders of Turkey to deal with. But if the question uh, is whether uh, Turkey's decision makers, the current decision makers, namely, I, actually there is only one decision maker in Turkey, his name is Tayyip Erdogan. Uh, and if you want another one because of his title, you have to put a comma, uh, not a point, but put a comma. Then you can also say Mr. Davutoğlu because he's the prime minister, but it is basically uh, Mr. Erdogan at the moment is the, the main uh, the, uh, policy maker. Uh, so in terms of him, or uh, if you put a number of others even, uh, if you would be speaking of Turkish leadership, whether they will or he will recognize that it was a genocide which was committed 100 years ago, the simple question will be no. Whether there will be a new voice that would come out from Turkey's policy makers, Turkey's leaders, different than what we heard before on this issue, yes. Uh, as um, in the 99th anniversary of the uh, Armenian genocide issue, April uh, this year, 2014, uh, Mr. Erdogan issued a statement which was very new in terms of wording and so on. And uh, so he wanted to share the agonies of the Armenians. So even this wording became a matter of excitement for many people in Turkey and outside as a new voice, but it didn't come to the point of a recognition that it was a genocide. And there shouldn't be any expectations that it will be in the coming year. In, 2015, not because they are not ready to absorb this historical issue as a fact of a genocide, but more than that, 
this very government and the very policy maker, Mr. Erdogan himself, has become tilting to more nationalistic and xenophobic positions than before. If you follow Turkish policies and the Turkish political stage very closely, in the last two, three months particularly, uh, when you hear Mr. Erdogan speaking, and he speaks three times a day, in average, sometimes, and most of the times, uh, his uh, discourse has become very nationalistic and anti-Western uh, and a bit xenophobic. So from this amalgamation, you, that it doesn't come out of a recognition, particularly at the election year in Turkey, 2015, that it was a genocide. Not only, of course, that they don't believe that it was a genocide. So it, it's also a matter of ideological uh, position. So this is about uh, the, 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 that issue. Uh, coming uh, to Ms. Perihan's question on, on the perception of the reconciliation process in Turkey, first I, might, I, I should make very clear that I don't believe that there is a reconciliation process in Turkey. To be called as a reconciliation process, because there is no process. It is at standstill, it's not moving, it's immobile. So when we speak of the process, we need certain elements to make it or to define it as a process. One is it has to have a roadmap. More importantly or equally important, it has to have a timetable. You have to know which stations you will be heading, which stations that you will be stopping to move to another station from there. In, 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 in such uh, imperatives which makes a process a process, we don't know it. There is a talk that a roadmap will be explained, announced, uh, that they are talking about a timetable or not. But it's just rumors mainly leaked to the press by pro-government journalists which puts them forward, when there is tension on the Kurdish issue, this comes up since two years that roadmap is coming. It will be announced and so on and so forth. So until now, we don't know whether there is a roadmap or a timetable. And if we don't know as a public, even if there is, it means there is not, because there is no public scrutiny on the, the, the process. What we are having, actually, which is a very positive and a good thing, is a state of cessation of hostilities. It's an enhanced, if I should call it as such, an enhanced uh, 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 ceasefire, which is very conducive for any reconciliation, for any resolution, for any peace to be achieved, which is good. There are no violence. People are not getting killed, no military personnel on the Turkish side, no Kurdish fighters of the PKK, so it's good. But this is not a reconciliation process. This is a management of the issue, which has been done successfully until now from the government side. As much uh, the, the, there was no violence, we, we, we did have two consecutive elections, one local elections, one presidential elections, and we will be having the parliamentary elections next year. So in a non-violent atmosphere, which is very important for the elections, the management of the whole issue under the title of a reconciliation process is a success on the part of the government. But it cannot be replaced by a real, genuine reconciliation process which we really need, that we need. But uh, whether we are having it or not, it's a matter of uh, a debate. What I believe, 
uh, it is not. That's what we are having. That's why the Kurdish issue and the climate pertinent to Kurdish issue is very fragile still in Turkey. Respond to any of the questions if they, if they would like. Would you like to respond to any? Maybe briefly about the first question. I mean, three million, the numbers are not uh, correct. This is a disputed issue. This is not the ideological uh, difference between the Turkish government and the rest of the world, or at least some countries. It is also a historical dispute. There is no established fact about Armenian genocide, and you cannot just ask it to recognize or not. About uh, Mr. Erdogan's <laughs> statement, actually it was not new. The foreign minister Davutoğlu at the time had developed two concepts. In the Turkish policy quarterly, you would recall he published a piece recently, right before that. There are two critical concepts there. The common pain, shared memory, to reconcile uh, with the Armenian issue. So these concepts uh, that underpin Erdogan's statement have been around for some time. Uh, the Foreign Minister Davutoğlu at that time was uh, building on that. And then uh, it is based on an understanding that the events of 1915 have to be put into a broader context. It is not just the Armenians that did suffer. The Kurds, the Turks, Azeris, they all suffered in the hands of each other to some extent. Probably more Armenians died in the hands of Kurds than the Turks at the time. So it's not just the Ottoman army uh, uh, killed uh, the Armenians. So we have to be just and fair when we do talk about history. About the resolution uh, process, uh, I agree with uh, Cengiz Bey. It is not reconciliation, but I don't think there is no process is the right way to describe it. There is a process. It is, in my eyes, initial sort of confidence building uh, phase, maybe not deliberately so, but it does serve that purpose, as you emphasized. I mean, when we look at the events of 6, uh, 7 uh, October uh, this year, the reaction uh, coming from Abdullah Jalan and other Kurdish actors and the people on the ground, they are, to me, uh, conveying the message that there is some minimum trust that's there, confidence that's there to move forward. So in that sense, it is a good basis. So about the roadmap, I don't know the details, of course, we don't know. But probably it's going to be based on the negotiations between the government and Öcalan and the HDP, other uh, Kurdish actors. But the fact that there are no clearly announced uh, roadmap could also be part of the negotiations strategy. So here the issue of timing, at what stage, what to give, what not to give. So these are all parts of the ongoing uh, strategy. But I don't think there is no process. And also about the timetables, uh, actually there was a timetable about the withdrawal of PKK militants from Turkey, which was not observed. So there are certain timetables on different issues, but the critical question is what Abdullah Jalan has also been arguing, moving from talking to negotiating. That stage, the threshold hasn't uh, been passed. Probably this is what we are going to observe in the coming uh, days, weeks, months, even years. We don't know how long it will take, but there is a process. So this is not a simple issue that you can solve overnight. And then uh, the lack of information is, of course, uh, in the nature of such uh, processes, you cannot just announce. So it will take two to tango. I think there is some confidence. But about the rest of Turkey, how it is explained, uh, to a certain extent, the rest of Turkey is in the dark. They don't know much, which is understandable given the nature of the challenge, which can be criticized from a democratic uh, point of view. But at the end of the day, I think, personally, the government has to do something to explain what it takes at one point when uh, certain extended rights are given uh, to the Kurds. But the way the government so far has uh, proceeded, to me, shows that uh, there won't be any special status or any uh, privileges designed for the Kurds only. It will be uh, part of the broader decentralization and democratization of Turkish state. If they can do it, I don't know.
but this will be uh, the way to go. There was a question about how can uh, Turkey told Öcalan while he's in prison. I guess he's getting a good treatment in the uh, prison. And the very fact that Turkey does talk to Öcalan comes with certain risks and costs. It was based on certain uh, assumptions that in the process, the PKK will also normalize, meaning it will be a legitimate partner that is civil, democratic, and acts in the political realm, not uh, keeping the arms, using the force of arms to influence local politics. This is the problem now. This is the spoiler in the process, that the PKK refuses to normalize, move from the gray area where the government is talking to PKK as a terrorist organization, taking the risk, into being a normal political actor. This is the challenge. This is the risk. This is, I think, the main obstacle. But another important threshold that has been passed, there was a legislation this summer that was passed from the parliament. That's important. Now, that legislation gives sort of authority and power to the government to negotiate. The negotiations were also in the gray area. You never know if uh, two terms later there is another party that comes to power, Nationalist Action Party, and tries the officials that were involved in the negotiations with Abdullah Öcalan. Now we have a legal framework to move forward with the negotiations. So I think so far we are not close to any roadmap, clear roadmap, but I don't think we didn't uh, go through a process. The process is in that sense uh, important especially in the way forward the government will also have to work more uh, focusedly on talking to the rest of the country explaining what it will uh, take so they tried other initiatives such as like the wise man or other stuff that did serve some purpose that are criticized now they are trying to revive that process there are certain trial and errors but the process is in the early phases i think there is some initial uh, good basis uh, confidence to move forward Mr. Birch, would you like to make a comment or? Um, just with regard to the not serious in, in Syria, I think uh, one should be very careful with that assessment. And my colleague Max Hoffman has spoken very eloquently about the fact that the military mission in Syria is a political mission. It is not only military, it's political in the sense that it is very targeted, um, very precise. <laughs> Uh, U.S. ground forces uh, to move in, but it is uh, in support of certain actors that have the capacity to change the region. And I think it's very important to keep, keep that in mind. The decision uh, to, uh, to start the mission against ISIS has not been easy for the President, for domestic reasons, uh, because it's very costly. People in the United States are very tired of the military engagement in the Middle East. And uh, it, was, it was a bold decision. Uh, some of us would have liked to see the president move earlier and more consistent on Syria. But to question uh, the seriousness of the current undertaking, I think, is unfair and also politically not accurate. I think with regard to the peace process, there is one um, important nexus between what is happening in northern Syria and that new emerging uh, uh, pragmatic partnership between the United States and Kurdish groups and the peace process in Turkey. The, um, the, the, pers the perspective from the US is that the US government has gone out of its way to protect Kobani. The mission is very expensive. It has political costs domestically, but also with regard to the US-Turkish relationship. So the expectation is that um, the Kurdish groups that uh, are interested in, in, ha in entering a conversation about the future of the region also continue their activities with regard to deepening democracy, um, allowing uh, Kurdish groups that are not of the governing parties participation, participation in power. And I think with regard to the domestic situation in Turkey, it is absolutely necessary that the PKK begins to broaden the nascent discussion about um, massive mistakes that have been made by the PKK in the past. That is not a discussion that is important because the 
the Turkish government on the other side then should admit that it has done uh, wrong. It is important for the Kurdish movement, uh, for the internal conversation, and also to make sure that this discussion is, is broad and international, because that will help to um, elevate the level of, uh, of uh, awareness about Kurdish issues in international conversations in Europe and in the United States. But it is, I think, a very important requirement to make the next step. Hopefully, hopefully, this panel is a starting point for further discussion on Turkish neighborhood policies in KRG. Unfortunately, we don't have more time. I have to end it here. Thank you very much for your contributions, and uh, thank you for your attendance. <laughs>